Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. I am Adam Harrison, and I would like to thank you all for attending the first of four webinars hosted by AFL for the energy market. I will be providing a brief overview of AFL before turning it over to Steve Walzak. So AFL is wholly owned by Fujikura. Fujikura is part of a $7 billion global manufacturing and technology leader. They have businesses in telecom, which is obviously where AFL falls, as well as energy, automotive. And for my golf fans out there, they actually make Fujikura golf shafts as well. So how AFL fits into that, we are about 1 billion of that $7 billion global revenue. And then we have a breakdown of that, about 75% of that is product and about 25% of that is gonna be uh, services as well. And then AFL by the numbers, uh, we were founded in 1984 as a joint venture between Alcoa and Fujikura. Uh, since then, Fujikura has become our wholly owned uh, owner of us. We are the number one provider of OPGW worldwide. Um, we have manufacturing facilities all over the globe that provide different products to the energy market and different other markets as well. So that breakdown looks something like this. We are pretty evenly distributed between the energy market, service provider market, enterprise and hyperscale market, as well as a small segment in the industrial market, which uh, comprises of a lot of the oil and gas industry, as well as medical field. So a lot of the people in the energy market have, have oftentimes known AFL to be just a cable provider. Um, AFL actually offers an end-to-end -end solution, which is part of this webinar series we want to encompass. So we not only offer the cable, we offer the connectivity aspects of that, the equipment, so the fusion splicers, the test and, uh, test and inspection equipment, as well as the accessories. Uh, so we're big in the conductor accessories as well as the fiber optic accessories. And then Steve's background is in training. So we also offer a variety of services and training support in building your network and helping you understand fiber even more. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Steve Walzak, who's gonna to talk to you about Fiber 101. Thank you very much, Adam. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you happen to be sitting. My name is Steve Walzak. I've been in the fiber optic industry for 35 years now. And before I begin, I just want to say how pleased I am to be invited to talk to the energy industry. In one of my previous positions, I was privileged to attend the Electrical Lineman's Rodeo, sponsored by Kansas City Power and Light. It was in St. Louis one year, in Kansas City the next. And 40 odd teams from all over the country and Canada and Mexico, from far as Hawaii to New York, came out to do insulator change outs, transformer change outs, hurt man rescue with gloves and with sticks, and just some of the most impressive people I've ever met in my life. So my, in, my introduction to the energy industry was from the best in the world, and you just have a really impressive industry. Today, we're going to talk about utility applications of fiber specifically to your market. Then we're going to go into technology. How does fiber work? What are the key performance parameters of a fiber system? How do we ensure our system's performing well? What kind of products exist that are specifically suited to the applications we talked about at the start of the talk? We'll start out with the generic benefits of fiber optics, lots of benefits. A fiber is very small. A fiber uh, strand is about the size of a human hair, uh, 125 microns in diameter. Has very high bandwidth, potentially a single fiber can carry terabits of information. Again, size of a human hair, so that is a lot of power in a small size. Upgradeability. You can buy the fiber system you need today, and once your fiber is installed, you can upgrade it by installing more powerful or faster electronics on the endpoints, and the fiber media can handle those to give you good return on your investment with a graceful upgrade. It's very reliable. It's designed to last 28 years. Many strands have lasted much longer, 
but its key factor for the energy industry is its EMI and RF immunity. Because the fiber is immune to electromagnetic interference, rights of way that nobody would ever think of carrying copper communications down or coaxial communications down, these rights of way now become very valuable and very usable to carry communications. So now that the energy industry has rights of way that are suitable for communications, what kinds of communications might they take down them? One, of course, could be your internal communications, your SCADA systems. These could be short distance, and in the early 80s, many SCADA systems that were suffering from a lot of EM interference were converted to multi-mode fiber. And we'll define all the terms we bring up in just a moment. Your transmission towers and distribution poles give you right of way that's inner office, inner plant, inner city, inner state. So you can use these for your internal telephone and communications, voice data, video systems, but you can also connect these systems to co-location centers and what we call POPs, points of presence, and lease or sell capacity to other providers on your rights of way. We all, if you're as old as me, you remember the REA, Rural Electrification Act, uh, now RUS, and now we know the CAFE Broadband Initiatives, Connect America Fund, and you were charged with universal service of bringing electricity to every barn, every farm, every farmhouse in America, and you've done that. So now you're ideally suited to bring fiber to the consumer, to the multi-dwelling unit, to the home, to the farm, in many, many communities that other providers really can service cost effectively. As we go on today, we're going to use a model, just a simple model of a light transmission system, uh, optical communication system, and all we have is a transmitter, which converts an electrical signal, voice data video, to light. The light travels through the physical plant that has multiple components, patch cords, patch panels, connectors, splices, cables, and that goes to a receiver which converts the optical signal back to an electrical signal, voice data video video, what have you, that's useful to us. This is the simplest model available. The fiber of the home model involves a single transmitter to multiple receivers, but basically each link can be modeled using this concept. So what is an optical fiber actually? It's a glass rod. It's a solid glass rod that has two regions in it, the core glass and the cladding glass. There's no hole in the center. There's no reflection, metal metallic reflectors inside. It's just two regions of glass. And it turns out that the core inside the inner region has a slightly different index of refraction than the cladding. The optical fibers are identified by their core cladding dimensions. And the core size could be nine, 50, or in some cases, 62.5 microns. The cladding dimensions are generally always 125 microns for standard communications fibers. There's also a coating on the fiber. This is strippable. It's not part of the fiber itself, but it's applied at the moment of manufacture. So when you see an optical fiber, 90% of the time, you're seeing a coated optical fiber. It aids in fiber handling, and we color these coatings so that we can identify one fiber from another. Fibers carry light. Light has a speed. We all learned in high school that light travels 180,000 miles roughly per second. That's in a vacuum. We understood the speed of light was a constant, but it's not. When it enters a different media, light changes its speed. And the speed of light in any media is the speed of light in a vacuum divided by that media's index of refraction. So when I say index of refraction, it's the speed that light travels in that media. One other thing that happens when light travels through from one media to another, if it enters square to the boundary of the two media, it simply slows down. But if it enters at an angle to the boundary of the two media, 
if it's traveling from the lower index to the higher index, it will refract or bend toward the normal or perpendicular. However, if we look at the blue box over on the right, if we look at, oh, my video's not playing. When we look at the blue box, oh, there we go. If we look at the blue box over on the right, we should notice that, uh, I got a video glitch here. If the light is traveling from the denser media, say the water upward to the air, it refracts away from the normal. And when it gets to a sufficient angle that it's almost 180 to the normal, it will reflect entirely. So we have this concept called total internal reflection. And this is how fibers work. So we can see the blue wave of light that enters between the two red dashed lines, which is the critical angle. If it comes in, when it hits the core clad boundary, it will skip off that boundary and be trapped inside that fiber. So for that ray of light, it perceives almost the cylindrical mirror inside the fiber formed by that core clad boundary. If light enters at an angle exceeding the critical angle, it will not be trapped. It will escape the fiber. Light not only has a speed, it has colors. It has a frequency and it has a wavelength. Optical people, we speak in wavelength. Um, let's see, my shirt's blue today, so I have a 410 nanometer shirt, and we can see colors from 400 to 770 nanometers, give or take, depending on your particular eye and if you had cataract surgery or not. However, if I had a red shirt, it could be a 650 nanometer shirt, and that would be its color. Now, fibers, optical fibers for communications all operate in the infrared range. So I'll say color sometime but I mean infrared color. So we have infrared and infrared or if our eyes could see in that region. And we operate in three major windows, the 850 nanometer window, the 1300 nanometer window, and the 1550 nanometer window. Multi-mode fibers operate in the 850 and 1300 nanometer primarily and they generally operate at one wavelength, although recently there is a, are four wavelengths in the 850 nanometer range that are being used simultaneously on multi-mode fibers. Single mode fibers operate initially in single channels in the 1310 nanometer and 1550 nanometer wavelength, but really today they've expanded to operate at multiple, multiple colors, if you will, all throughout the band. For coarse wavelength division multiplexing, fibers operate from 1,271 nanometers to 1,611 nanometers with 18 channels. In the 1,550 range, we can pack multiple channels in about a 30 nanometer band. We can pack about 80 different colors of light. So that's how much that increases the bandwidth a single fiber can carry 80 fold. I mentioned multi-mode and single mode fibers. I mentioned that fibers are defined by their core clad dimensions, and this is how we can tell a single mode fiber from a multi-mode fiber. <clears throat> the two fibers in the upper right are multi-mode fibers with a 50 micron and 62.5 micron core respectively. All of the newer multi-mode fibers are 50 micron, 62.5, there's a lot of it around, but it's more of a legacy grandfather technology at this time. Sort of like we don't see CAT5 much now that we have CAT6. All the fibers we see are pretty much 50 micron in the multi-mode world. In the single mode world, we have a very, very tiny nine micron core. That's the light carrying portion of the fiber. And it can have a 250, meter co 250 micron coating or a 200 micron coating. With a smaller coating, we can get more optical fibers in a single cable which is desirable for outside plant purposes. When we're using fiber indoors, in addition to the primary coating, and a 250 micron primary coated fiber has about the feel of eight pound test monofill fishing line. It's pretty thin, it's about the size of a hair. But when we wanna handle these in a building, make them a little more friendly, 
we buffer them out to a 900 micron coating. And for my fishing friends out there, it's kind of like about the diameter of fly line. It's a little bit easier to discriminate them and handle them. And they're a little more protected from handling with that extra buffer. So I've heard multi-mode, I've heard single mode. Well, what's a mode? A mode is a path of light that the photons take through the fiber that is supported by the fiber geometry. If you're a physicist, I'll tell you that a mode is a single solution of what Maxwell's equation. And in a multi-mode fiber, there are multiple solutions. So in a multi-mode fiber, I can have many, many modes, some traveling very near the center of the fiber and some traveling closer to the edges. When I design a single mode fiber, I make the core so small that it can only support one mode right down the center of the fiber. So if I have many modes, I can use lower cost. If I have a big core, 50 micron, I can use lower cost transmitters because it's fairly easy to pump light into this 50 micron core with a not too sophisticated transmitter. However, because some of the modes are traveling in the center and some are traveling on the edges, some have to travel a little further. They bounce from edge to edge. So we get some pulse spreading called modal dispersion. I'm going to use a very crude analogy here. Don't take it too far, but it might help you conceptually. I kind of think of multi-mode fiber and single-mode fiber as two completely different media. Yes, they're both optical fibers, but we almost never connect one to the other. And we almost never use them, we don't use them combined often in a single link. So multi-mode fiber is kind of like twisted pair. Easy to terminate, short distance, low bandwidth. Single mode fiber is more like coaxial cable. Long range, a little bend sensitive, high bandwidth, and the connectors are absolutely critical in technology. So multi-mode fiber, lower cost electronics to get light into them, easier to splice and terminate because they have a big light carrying portion to connect, but really limited to only about two kilometers distance because of this modal dispersion. If you look at the applications over on the right, what do those applications look like or sound like? They sound like a SCADA system to me. Single mode fiber, on the other hand, will be used for your inter-office or inter-plant communications. Since there's only one pathway, we do not have the modal dispersion. So the bandwidth is much, much, much higher. However, to couple light into that very small core, we need to use slightly more expensive electronics, i.e. lasers, we do use lasers for multi-mode, but some low-cost surface-emitting lasers. In single-mode fibers, we use edge-emitting lasers with very small spot sizes. So they have greater bandwidth, they go great distances, but the transmitters and receivers get a little more expensive. Single-mode fibers are used for long-haul and fiber to the home. I said we have to inject power into the fiber, optical power. So we use dBm to express optical power and dB to express differences in optical power. Now, if you've tested a printed circuit board, you know you've used dBmV, that's dB, a logarithmic scale relative to millivolts. We use dBmW, we don't see the W here, but the unit is dBmW, the W silent, if you will. But we reference the dB scale to one milliwatt of optical power. We'll talk about transmitters and receivers and their power levels for just a moment. We can use a light emitting diode for multi-mode fibers or vertical cavity surface laser, surface emitting lasers. Single mode, we use fabry pro lasers or distributed feedback lasers. One thing to know about distributed feedback lasers, which are very common in single mode, they're very high performance but they operate on a feedback loop and don't like feedback from the system. So if your system has reflections in it, you can disturb your laser transmitters. You can start your system out with, let's see, in 1984, a 45 megabit per second transmitter, and then you can upgrade that to a 2.4 gig, you can upgrade that to a 10 gig and up, and upgrade to multiple channels or multiple colors. Your photodiodes 
they receive the signal on the other side. They have to be able to receive modulation or detect modulation at the speed of the transmitter. So these are often sold in sort of pairs or transceiver sets. And your photodiode has a minimum signal it can perceive. If the power is too low, the photodiode won't be able to demodulate it. The DBM's W scale, zero DBM is one milliwatt of power. 30 DBM, every 10 dB is a power of 10. So 10, 20, 30, 30 dBm is 1,000 milliwatts or one watt. So you can see already that optical communications operate at slightly lower power levels than the energy industry is used to transmitting. When we have less than one milliwatt of power, the dB scale is negative, but that just means it's less than one milliwatt. Negative three dB is a half a milliwatt. Negative 10 is a tenth of a milliwatt. Negative 20 is a twentieth of a milliwatt. Negative 30 is a microwatt or one one thousandth of a milliwatt. What are typical power levels we might see? For multi-service operators running cable TV systems, they may have transmitters as powerful as plus 24 or plus 27 dBm. In the optical world, 100 milliwatts into a fiber is a very, very high powered system. May not seem like it is, but it is. And plus 27 is about the highest power transmitter I've ever encountered in a practical system. And we don't use those for very long lengths. We usually split those out and broadcast them. However, the receivers, because these are often analog or RF signals, need to receive the signal as high as zero dBm power. Now you'll notice from 20 dBm to zero dBm, we've lost 99% of our power. An energy company would never survive with line losses of 99%, but these are common to us because we're not selling the power, we're selling the modulation on the power. And as long as a receiver can get enough power to demodulate it, it's happy. A telco transmitter may put out about zero dBm, plus five to minus five dBm in a digital system, and the receivers can operate down to as low as negative 25 dBm or so. So we can have high high dynamic ranges, even pushing almost 30 dB, dB difference, almost losing, receiving one one thousandth of our power at the far end instead of even one one hundred. But those line losses are acceptable to us. In the SCADA world or the data system or indoor world, a transmitter might be an LED or a low powered pixel putting out somewhere in the negative 20 dBm range, and we may receive in the negative 23 dBm range. That's still 50% loss in power but it's a very small difference because we're only going a few hundreds of meters or tens of meters. So we talked about transmitter and receivers. Let's look at the physical plant. Let's look at the cable, the fiber, the patch cords and its operating mechanisms. The biggest thing we worry about, we do worry about line loss. We worry about attenuation in fiber. The attenuation depends on the type of fiber you have, the color of light you're transmitting, and the attenuation is caused by absorption of the light into the glass. The glass actually heats up a little bit and scattering of the light. If you turn on your headlights on a foggy day, you know what scattering looks like. Some of the lights just scattered by the interaction of the molecules with the light. Now, you say absorb some of the energy and the fiber heats up a little bit, you're not gonna feel a fiber get hot, it's not to that level, but if you do put plus 30 dBm into a fiber, because it's in such a small nine micron core, you will in fact melt it. So using the dB scale again, instead of referencing it to one milliwatt, but just maybe making it an arbitrary scale, any dB level just simply represents a percentage or a ratio or a fraction. If my boss doubled my salary tomorrow, I'd get a 3 dB raise. Uh, more likely, if my boss cut my salary in half, i get a 3 dB pay cut. So plus 3 dB is double the power, minus 3 dB is 50% of the power. And every 10 dB is one power of 10 of loss or gain, depending on the sign. Now, we have a signal loss chart here. 
These are loss values, and you're asking, why aren't these negative? They should be negative if they're loss values. It's because I put the word loss in the chart so that I didn't have to use a lot of minus signs. I say bink. But these are dot 1 dB loss or negative 1 dB difference. A cabled fiber, a multi-mode fiber, might lose about 3 dB in a kilometer run. So it would be at 50% power after 1,000 meters of transmission. On the other hand, single mode fibers operating in the 1550 nanometer region may have dot 2 dB of loss per kilometer, which means 50 kilometers of single mode fiber might still have 90% or would exhibit, deliver 10% of their power at the end of a 50 kilometer run. So 50 kilometers single mode, about a 10 dB loss, 100 kilometers single mode, 20 dB loss, that's a valid single mode system. We have a couple of ways of connecting fibers. We wanna carry fibers and string them to distribution poles and transmission towers. So we're not gonna string single eight pound test monofill out there that would they break eventually. We have to protect them. We put them in cables. Cables have multiple fibers. A fiber cable might be a half inch in diameter well, we can't get 100 miles of half inch diameter cable on a reel, so we need multiple reels, and these reels have to be joined after they're installed. And we can either splice fibers with a fusion splicer, there are mechanical splices, but they're not as common, or we could terminate fibers with a connector in, when we get to a building and we want to rearrange those fibers in some way, shape, or form. If I'm using a fiber connector at a patch panel, a good quality clean fiber connector will have from dot one to about dot five loss in single mode typically about a quarter db or dot one db is good that's about 97.7 percent efficient transmission so only about a three percent power loss a dirty connector can have a db of power loss even several db so a dirty connector can have as much loss as five kilometers of fiber so these connectors are critical points for us to check their performance, make sure they're clean and operating well. Fusion splice loss values are on the order of a hundredths of a dB. It's not unusual to have a one one hundredth or three one hundredth or four one hundredth dB loss fusion splice. So we can place these in the system. And if we have 10 dado two fusion splices, then we have the equivalent of one kilometer of single mode cable loss. Something that could make our fiber cable have more loss than it should would be a macro bend. A macro bend is when you bend the cable below its minimum bend radius and it exhibits excess loss. If you looked at aerial plant anywhere in the country, you've seen these little bow ties or snowshoes, and these are bend radius limiters. Uh, they're very common. We try not to bend the cable too much. These are things you learn in installation practices. Another type of bending that can occur, the cable could still be laid straight, but we can get a loss due to bending. And it's because we're impinging on the fiber itself and bending the core clad boundary. So if we have an indoor fiber that's 900 micron buffered and I tie a tie wrap on it too tight or I kink it around the corner of a cabinet and I pinch it, it might have a loss even though it looks like it's going in the proper direction. These are two things we have to watch out for. However, we don't like to give you a problem without at least part of a solution. In those cases where we really want to route fibers tightly, like in buildings for distributed antenna systems or in a splitter cabinet where there's lots and lots of fibers in a small area for distribution to homes, we can use a bend in sensitive fiber when necessarily uses fiber for long haul, although we do when it's done, but in certain areas you can optimize your system by using, using bend in sensitive fiber to cut down your losses in slack loops and tight splitter cabinets. One of the impairments we can have on our system is called dispersion. This will limit our loss. So our power loss limits our distance, our optical dispersion limits our distance, and we already mentioned modal dispersion. Modal dispersion cuts our transmission distances down to just a few kilometers. 
What dispersion is, is a spreading of the fiber pulses, the optical signals in time. So a few of the photons are traveling faster than other photons. Some are traveling slower. So some of the straggling photons from one pulse uh, are caught up to by the leading photons from another pulse. And it kind of blurs the edges of our ones and zeros. That happens very quickly in multimode fiber. If we're at low bit rates, it's not a problem. But when we go to very high bit rates, it can be a major problem as we can see here on the right. We have a low, medium, and high bit rate from top to bottom, and we have the transmitted signal and the received signal. In the one gigabit data rate in the middle, the received signal still has a great deal of dynamic range between ones and zeros. But at the very high data rate, we've got intersymbol interference, and we have plenty of optical power, but no modulation, no differences in optical power. And that's a problem. So we said we have modal dispersion in multimode fiber. Single mode fiber doesn't have dispersion. Well, actually it does, but from a different cause. And it's a much, much lower magnitude dispersion, but it does occur over distance and it depends on a lot of uh, characteristics of your system. But it turns out that the lasers, even a very, very, very good laser uh, distributed feedback has a very small line width. So a 1551 nanometer laser might have a little 1551.1 color and a little 1551.0 or a little 1551.0 color. So there's tens of picometers of different color and the colors travel slightly different speeds. So this causes chromatic dispersion. It's well known. It's specified in the fiber and it's engineered out. If you are moving from a one gigabit data rate to a 10 gigabit data rate, then maybe your dispersion can bother you, but we have systems that could compensate for it. So that's something to be engineered in, something you have to be aware of. So I want to talk about cable designs in general. There's two general kinds, tight buffered and loose to loose buffered cables are designed for the outdoors and they decouple the fiber from mechanically from the cable tight buffered fibers just build up the plastic around the cable they're usually used indoors we can mechanically isolate the fibers from the environment so when the cable expands and contracts the fiber is not pulled on or stretched or perturbed Inside, we don't worry about that as much, but outside we do. We also want to protect the fiber from dirt, sand, grit, abrasives, uh, water, whatever. Also, we, the cable will organize your fibers into groups for efficient organization. And some cables carry not only optical signals, but electrical power. So we'll see in a moment. A loose buffer design can be armored or non-armored. Armor is used for rodent protection. It consists of a polyethylene jacket, some linear aramid yarn, a brand name would be Kevlar, um, or fiberglass strands for a strength element, for tensile strength, some kind of tubes for the fiber to float in, and a little bit more fiber than there is cable, a 1,000 meter Loose tube cable might have 1,001 meters, uh, or excuse me, 1,010 meters of fiber in it. Tight buffer designs don't have over length because we don't worry about the expansion and contraction because they don't go through as many temperature extremes. We have tight buffered fibers. We can have multiple tight buffered fibers with aramid yarns in a jacket, or each fiber, if we look at the bottom breakout cable here, each fiber can have its own aramid yarn and jacket to make it very robust. We could put a connector on that, handle that, and not worry about pulling on the fiber and breaking it. Also, these indoor cables have fire ratings for riser and plenum environments. Certain fiber optic cables are designed for aerial installation. For teleco applications, we either take a generic loose tube cable and lash it to a steel messenger, or we can extrude the steel messenger with the cable with a web between them. It's called a figure eight cable. 
You can imagine if you look at this cable end on, it'll look like a figure eight. And it's a one-time install with the steel supporting the cable. Where we can't use metal, for example, in the utility environment on distribution poles, we put extra aramid yarns in the cable and these cables have very, very high tensile strengths and they support themselves. These cables are simply sagged and tensioned for installation. They're not lashed to anything. We also on the transmission towers, we can embed fibers into the optical phase ground wire. Typical telco cables will have a steel or dielectric central strength member, maybe armored or not. Utility cables usually have a dielectric central strength member and are non-armored. These are the bend radius specifications during installation and long term. And a tensile rating for a typical a standard cable is about 600 pounds. For all dielectric self-supporting cables, the tensile ratings of these cables are in the thousands and thousands of pounds. And these are typically engineered for a particular span and it's slope terrain and distance between poles to work with your engineer on an ADSS cable to design it for your system. Optical ground wire cables come in more than one flavor. They have their own benefits and advantages depending on your installation. Just want to leave with a note, one more note about fiber connectors. We've talked about loss, we've talked about dispersion. The one other impairment that could take your system down is called reflection. And when we mate two connectors, we get a reflection value from them. When the light when we fuse fibers glass to glass, we don't have reflection. When we mate fibers and just butt two pieces of glass together, that transition is not perfect and could cause reflectances that could be relatively high. With flat connectors, we can get as much as 1% of the power back to our system. That won't work for a single mode DFB lasers. So we have polishing techniques, super polish, super physical contact, ultra physical contact to limit these reflectances down to one one hundred thousandth, one one millionth of our forward power. If we want to get lower reflectance than that from the aspect of our transmitter, we can angle the face of the connector as shown in the top pair of connectors. We have the same amount of reflectance, but it's vectored away from the core and won't bother our laser. The other thing that could cause reflectances and losses is any dirt, dust, or oil on your connector faces. I think on the back of every line truck you have, it says, call before you dig. And you ask people to call before you dig because if they don't, the results can be catastrophic. We don't say, gee, go plant your uh, rose bushes and then call us if your internet doesn't work or call us if the handle the shovel tingles a little bit, you want you want that area marked. Now, nobody's gonna die if, if you connect two dirty connectors, but your system will, your system won't function at all. And the permanent, and the point is, these connectors are so precisely polished and made it under such high pressure that the dirt can embed permanently in the glass and you've killed the connector. It is no longer good. It takes exactly one mating of dirty connector to ruin it. You're gonna learn a lot about that in webinar number four delivered by my colleague, Michael Schult. So this was probably a lot of information in a short space, like taking a drink from a fire hose. But to review, we defined a few terms. We discussed a little physics and technology. We mentioned some applications for optical communications. We talked about some of the system components and building blocks and we talked about their performance parameters. We talked about the big three, loss, reflectance, and dispersion being the things that could take your system down or make it perform poorly and the kinds of things you'll have to be aware of when you get into fiber optic communication. And we talked about cable function and what cables do and cable designs. Now, if you're interested in more on this, there's, you can learn more about design of systems, installation of systems, uh, cable selection, how to turn a system up and commission it for uh, operation, how to provision customers on a system, how to locate trouble on a system, and even more advanced technologies. 
Now I'm with Light Brigade and we're the training and education arm of AFL. And I'm pleased to say that we're able to offer you by attending this webinar, we've offered you a discount on some future Light Brigade classes. There's details in your marketing emails on this. And please note, I think if you attend multiple seminars, you get a little bigger discount, but note, you don't have to attend all the seminars to get a discount. So I'd invite you to invite your colleagues and coworkers to sign up for the next three. There's still a bit, the discounts available to them. And moreover, each of the webinars can stand on its own. This webinar may have been interesting, but it's not a prerequisite to understanding the oncoming webinars. So please invite more folks to jump in on those. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Adam Harrison. Thank you, Steve, for the great presentation. Before we conclude this uh, session, I want to give a quick reminder about the upcoming sessions. And as just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, uh, so far we don't have any, so Steve's done an excellent job of explaining all of this. Please enter that in the side panel and we can address those at the very end of the presentation. So on September 11th, we will have Tyler Toodle and Carson Joy discussing aerial fiber optic cable options. Then on October 23rd, we will have Kurt Turner presenting on the causes of aeolian vibration and how to mitigate against it. Then finally, we're going to wrap up the series on uh, November 20th with Michael Scholten presenting on test and inspection. So with that, I thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, I'll give it a few minutes if anybody wants to chime in with a couple of questions, and then we can get Steve back over here to address those. We have a question, uh, how do you deal with modal dispersion? There's several ways, you, you don't deal with it, you be aware of it and you watch your ratings of your particular transceiver pair. Um, the way that you launch your laser into your multi-mode fiber, if you launch the laser, if it's a tightly formed laser beam that launches into the center of a multi-mode fiber, then it will have less modal dispersion than an LED source or a, a broadly formed laser spot. Now, you're not gonna know what your spot size is of your laser, you just know you have 50 micron fiber, but you'll go into a chart on your 10 gigabit or 100 gigabit or 400 gigabit transceiver pair, and it will say this operates on this operates on 50 micron fiber, and it has a reach of 37 meters. This transceiver pair operates on 50 micron fiber and has a reach of 80 meters. So it, it probably costs more and may have a more exotic or a little more special transmitting laser on it. The other thing that's done is some of these, trans you use multiple fibers. so. You use four multi-mode fibers to get a 100 gigabit signal through instead of one. And if your modal dispersion says you need to reach 80 meters and the max you can go is 25 gig, there are transceiver pairs that have multi-fiber connectors on them that have four transmit and four receive. And you have four 25 gig signals forward, four 25 signals reverse. And the transceiver pair electrically, though, as it communicates to its line card, it's per second transmission system. It's put back together inside the transmitter. So that's really just application-driven choice of components. But you you can't you can't make modal dispersion go away. You can only use um, the best distances you can get, or more fibers, or you pick a single mode link. What else do we have, Adam? So somebody said, could you explain the water peak term? You know, this was a very brief presentation, so I try not to go into too much um, 
detail on technology, but it's a, it's a great one. When we talked about the transmission windows, we talked about 1300 or 1310 for single mode and 1550. And people go, well, why 1310 and why 1550? And the reason was we didn't want to be anywhere near 1400. It turns out that when fibers are manufactured, early days, they absorbed water during the manufacturing process just because of the process. And water has an OH ion in it that vibrates right at 1383 nanometers. So the loss of an optical fiber might be 0 0.35 dB at 1310, 0 0.2 dB at 1550, but at 1383, it was two or three dB per kilometer. It was very high loss. So the fiber is essentially not transparent, that it's dark. That is called the water peak. If you have a legacy fiber, if you have an old fiber in your system, and you want to do coarse wavelength division multiplexing on them, you usually avoid that area. Mo many coarse wavelength division multiplexing systems will go from 1471 to 1611 for eight channels. If they want to go to 10 channels, they'll go to 1451 and 1431, but now they're getting dangerously close to that water peak area. It's a broad area. It's not, it's centered around 1383. They're taking a risk of higher losses there. Some systems operate eight channels from 1471 to 1611, and then pick up two channels that they know there's no water at, at 1291 and 1311. So the water peak is either avoided or you can get a broadband source and a spectrum analyzer or a 1383 source or a 1383 OTDR and test your cables to see if they have a water peak or not. And then if you have cables in the ground that have it, you have to avoid that transmission region. So it limits your total potential bandwidth, but there's lots and lots of bandwidth out there in the other windows. So it's just being aware of it. Many or most new fibers, either by specification when you buy them, the manufacturer specs will define whether they are rated for a water peak or not. If they are low water peak, which is a G652 rating, or a standard G652 rating that says they might have a water peak, you select those. One might be just a couple pennies more than the other, but Legacy fibers, it, it's a possible concern. It's a great question. It's a pure application question. Email me on it. So we've got another one with long transmission lines and Illumicore OPGW. How do you know if you have too much power loss and need to compensate at some distance along the line? Well, the power loss, the nice thing is the performance of the fiber, if you build your cable right, if your cable is designed so it doesn't induce any stresses on the fiber, then the fiber performance is extremely predictable. So we take two numbers, the output power of your laser and the sensitivity, sensitivity of your receiver, and the difference between those numbers is called your power budget. We show those numbers. So maybe you're, you can, you're allowed 20 dB loss. We set the length of your system so that we know the fiber will exhibit less than 20 dB loss. If it's properly installed, the performance of the fiber is absolutely predictable. Now, if you have to go further than that, there are other technologies. You would either go through a repeater, you would receive the signal, demodulate it down to electrical and retransmit it on another laser that would send it, say another 100 kilometers, or at certain wavelengths of fiber, particularly in the 1550 nanometer region, we would use a fiber amplifier. There's an item known as an erbium doped fiber amplifier. We charge it with um, high frequency lasers. The erbium glows when photons hit it, it kicks off additional photons. It's kind of like an op amp. It works sort of like old tube amplifiers in a physics realm and I'm oversimplifying. But we can boost that signal without having to demodulate it by putting through a loop of charged erbium fiber. So you just, that's a great question. And that's why we learn these numbers and we learn the characteristics of our system. And we talk with application engineers and we design these performances in. But if there's damage to your system, excess loss, repairs, reroutes, 
then you're going to have to go there with a power meter and say, gee, do we still have the performance we had? You'll learn more about testing and verifying these performance parameters live in webinar number four. With that, I think we'll be concluding the webinar. Appreciate everybody attending today and hope you can attend the future ones as they come up. Thank you all for attending.